Uh, hopefully you watched the video that finished where am I? the seafarer. Uh, so today we're going to start the Dream of the Ring. Um, and there is a quiz up for the Wanderer and Seafarer uh, due Sunday night, 11.59. So the Dream of the Rude, I've got two days for this, and I'm trying to figure out where really would be the best place to stop. Um, oh, that spot right there. We're going to stop, I think, just before line 78. Hopefully we'll get that far. Um, so the Dream of the Rude is preserved in a manuscript called the Vercelli Manuscript, which is in Vercelli, Italy. Right? Uh, it's an old English manuscript. It's got a variety of things in it. Your introduction um, talks... I thought it did. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say hardly anything about the Vercelli. Collection of English religious prose and poetry written in southern England late later 10th century, taken to Vercelli, Italy, sometime afterwards, where it still remains. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, so that's what gives us the copy of the poem we have. The poem doesn't survive in any other manuscript context. All right? As with most old English poetry, not all, but the vast majority, there's only one surviving copy. Right? There's only one surviving copy of Beowulf, there's only one surviving copy of The Wanderer, The Seafarer, uh, pretty much all the poems that are in the Exeter manuscript. And it's kind of interesting. Um, I, don't think, I don't think I ever noticed this before, and I'm kind of curious why. Um, your, your textbook you know, starts with the Old English stuff. Skipping B. Um, starts with the Exeter book, Elegies. And so you have the wanderer and the seafarer, and you've got the ruin and wife's lament. And then it gives you the dream of the root. Well, the dream of the root is not in the Exeter book. And then after the dream of the root, we go back to the Exeter book. And it gives a variety of um, riddles, just a few, like five or six, maybe a few more than that. Nah, more than that, like ten or so. And then it goes to Beowulf. Um, and I'm just kind of curious why the editors decided to break up the Exeter book material by putting the Dream of the Root in there. And I, I honestly have no idea why I would have put the Exeter book materials all in the same file. So the Richelli manuscript preserves the poem, but interestingly, um, early. A portion of the poem survives on a stone cross right, called spelled Ruthwell Cross, pronounced Rivel, like dribble without the D. Rivel, the Rivel Cross. And this is in Dumfries, Scotland. Been to England, been to Scotland a few times. I've never made it over to uh, Dumfries because I would love to see this thing um, in person. Uh, my sister and brother-in-law were there a few years ago, and she, she took a bunch of pictures and such for me. So this cross, which dates from the early 8th century, 700 to maybe 750, probably 725, um, would be about the best late date, um, that you've got a little picture of, part of it. It stands, probably it originally stood close to 25 to 30 feet tall, right? And it has carvings on the two wide faces and on the two thinner side faces, as well as on the arms of the cross and the top. The only problem is it's been broken. During the Renaissance, excuse me, during the Reformation most likely, the cross was knocked down and broken in two, and part of it was removed. Okay. So if you look at it today, and there are various places you can go and you can see um, this one. Right here. 
replicas made, like in where is it at? Durham Cathedral. They've got a separate area you know, for archaeological stuff. They've got a kind of a mock-up of the Riddle Cross, you know, and there's a, a big chunk, I don't know, how, remember how much, like three or four feet, that's missing that, you know, they just put a blank piece, essentially, of stone there. British, um, not library, British Museum also has, they have a whole room that is just cast replicas of a ton of stuff. I mean, you can't go in the room, you can walk around it like on this over, and it's just, you know, statuary everywhere, right? This, as I said, dates from the early 8th century. This dates from the late 10th century. All the old English poetic manuscripts. I should have mentioned this earlier. You got the Bricelli manuscript, Junius manuscript, the Exeter manuscript. This is also called book. And then you have, um, it's typically just called the Beowulf manuscript, which includes not only Beowulf, but several other poems and some prose things, right? Four major poetic work called codices. It's the plural of codex. Codex is the Latin word for what we would call book, right? But these are manuscripts. These are all handwritten. They all date. All of these date from late 10th to early 11th century, roughly 975 to about 1025. All right? So, almost all the old English poetry that survives is in these. There are some pieces that survive in other, other places, okay? But this is the vast majority. Right? So the, the cross dates from the early 8th century. And it's got a portion of the poem, not much. Right? Um, I don't remember if your book introduction mentions how many, but it just says several. I want to say it's, it's less than a dozen of the 150 lines of the poem. So that can mean a couple of things. It can mean the poem as a whole was in existence when this cross was made in the early 8th century, 700 to 725. Or it could mean that those lines were added to the cross after the cross was set up, after the poem was written. We don't know when exactly the poem was written. We don't know for the vast majority of Old English poetry when it was written or composed. We know the time by which it had to have been composed. It's this. It had to have been composed in order to find its way into these manuscripts. But we don't know the earliest that it could have existed. Um, Cadman's hymn we do, because if we attribute it to Cadman, it had to be when Cadman was alive. Okay? And he died about the same time as Abbas Hill, right around 681 or so. So, the dream of the rood. What is a rood? It's a cross, right? If you go, and you'll hear this more so in Scotland today than you will in England. If you go to a church or cathedral, more likely, and they still have one up, you know, the, the docent, the person who walks you around and tells you about the history of the cathedral and such, will mention, if there's one still there, the rude screen, okay? And that is the wall, essentially, that separates the nave of the church from the sanctuary, the holy area of the church, where there would be an altar, all right? <clears throat> Originally, this rude screen, because sometimes it's not a solid wall, it might be like latticework, etc would have imagery on it, icons, iconography. Okay? The icons would be images, you know, if this church was named after a saint, it would have an image of the saint. It would have an image of Christ, Mary, things like that. It might have, you know, Old Testament stories, things like that, 
portrayed in imagery. Since people, for the vast majority, couldn't read, and two, even if they could read, they didn't have Bibles to read. So the biblical stories were told by an image. Uh, when we get up and talk about Shakespeare, you know, Shakespeare's father was the mayor of Stratford for a while. While he was mayor, the word came down from Parliament, he had to cover up all the religious iconography because of the Reformation. And he did. Even though it's almost certain, he was still a believing Catholic. He wasn't Protestant. And so he did cover it up very, very poorly. He, he had to put like a thin coat of whitewash so that the images could still kind of be seen. Right? So, dream of the root. It's the dream of the cross. It's not the cross dreaming. It's somebody dreaming about the cross. Okay? And it's kind of divided into three sections. So not, not divided how the book has it, you know, where you've got a break between lines. Divided kind of um, thematic or content-wise. The first section is where the dreamer tells us I'm dreaming in what he sees, right? And that's about from the beginning to the end of line 27. That sets up what's going to come, right? Then we get what it is he dreams. And he dreams the cross of Christ speaks to him, right? So the next part is the cross relating history. The cross is personal history, right? I was born as a tree, or raised as a tree if you want. Bad men came and cut me down. They raised me up as a cross. I crucified the Lord of glory, blah, blah, blah. Okay? In that long section ends with the burial of Christ and the cross, not the same place. Right? The next section begins around line, uh, sorry, and that ends around line 77. Sorry, it's four sections. Then the cross addresses the dreamer specifically and says, now you can hear, my dear hero, blah, 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 blah. And this section kind of serves as an introduction to the next section. So I'm going to, I said three, then four, now it's going to be five sections. And then he gives the dreamer a charge. So the third section is kind of like, 78 through 91 to, through 94. It's a brief part. And then he gives the dreamer a charge. So, starts off, the dreamer tells us what he sees, and then the dreamer tells us what the cross said to him, relating history, and then the cross addresses the dreamer in the present, okay, and then the cross lines 95 and follows gives the dreamer a charge. I command you to, right? Now I bid you, he says, the cross says. And that part ends with around line 121. So it's kind of like the cross saying, this is the reason why you're having this dream. Go do X, Y, Z. And then the final section begins line 122 where the dreamer kind of stops the dreaming part and tells us what the dreamer took away from the dream and how the dream has affected his life in looking forward to the future. Okay? That's the general structure. Now let's go back to the beginning. Okay, that took 15 minutes that we didn't have. Listen. The Old English... 
several old English forms begin this way, is what? Modern English, what? That's all it means. Several old English forms, this, Beowulf, Andreas, uh, another one, Andrew and the City of the Cannibals or something like that, um, all begin this way, okay? And it's not, it's probably, imagine this is crystal. It's not, it probably is supposed to serve like, you know, you go to a dinner party, you go to, and somebody wants to make a toast, somebody's getting married, and somebody stands up and doesn't work with plastic. And they take a fork to a wine goblet, beep, 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 it catches everybody's attention. There's actually been translations of Beowulf that begin, yo! It kind of stops the noise in the hall. Okay? So bear in mind, these are all composed to be sung in a hall. And what else is going on in the hall? There's drinking, there's joking, there's various things going on. Okay? Listen. I will speak of the sweetest dream what came to me in the middle of the night. Okay. And I'm going to use a translating it that way. Because a lot of people translate this as saying, I will speak of the sweetest dream that I had in the middle of the night. But the Old English says, the dream that came to me. All right. So it's like a vision. Because the vision doesn't begin in here. The vision is external. It comes from outside. I always, when I'm teaching my Harry Potter, my Lord of the Harry Potter course, and we get to the part about the prophecy, the prophecy regarding you know, Harry and Lord Voldemort, or whoever in Lord Voldemort. I always ask the students, where's the prophecy come from? And they'll say, oh, it comes from, and they'll name a person. And I'll say, no, 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 you misunderstand me. Where does the prophecy come from? That is, it comes through that person. Who speaks it through that person? Where, where does it come from to that? That person is merely a conduit. They're like a, a long horn that you blow through. Sound enters here, comes out louder here. Okay? Who's doing the blowing through the horn that makes Dumbledore, you know, and others hear this prophecy? It's never answered within those books. So, I had this dream in the middle of the night when speech bearers slept in their rest. Speech bearers. The old English is reord bearer. And that literally means speech bearers. Who are speech bearers? Who bear speech? Us, humans, humankind, mankind, men, if you want, right? So why not just translate that as when people are asleep? Because that's what's meant by it, right? Now, the Old English uses this kind of word because of the required metrics of the line and such, because of the required alliteration, that is, the poet needed something that began with an R. Okay, that was the alliterate, I think. That was the... Yep. So then, rarer barren, uh, resta wunadon. There is not R. Okay. The alliteration is determined by the resta, the first stress syllable in the second half line. So we needed something else that began with an R. And we use this. So, speaker tells us, I had this dream, came to me in the middle of the night when people were asleep. It seemed that I saw a most wondrous tree, raised on high, wound Round with light. So sees this tree, and by tree means cross. He doesn't mean a little like a mighty oak or something like that. 
and it's got light surrounding it. I don't think, you know, we could go all Marvel, you know, special effects and stuff and have a tree and it's got these like ropes of light. That'd be pretty cool. Um, the brightest of beams. All that beacon was covered in gold. Now the old English word that's translated beacon could also be sign. That is, it could also be translated sign. It was covered in gold. Jim stood fair at the earth's corners, and there were five upon the cross beam. Hmm. All the angels of the Lord looked on, fair through all eternity. That was no felon's gallows, but holy spirits beheld them there, men over the earth and all this glorious creation. Okay. Jim stood fair at the earth's corners, and there were five upon the cross beam. How big is this cross that he sees? What are the gems that he sees at the earth's corners? First of all, where are the corners of the earth? Is the earth square? No. Did they know the earth was round? Yes, actually they did. The whole thing about, you know, Christopher Columbus discovering the world, the world, that's total nonsense. Aristotle knew the world was round. Okay? Probably what it is implying is the reader is giving us an idea of his um, physical position while he's dreaming. He's lying flat on the ground. And he has this vision. And the cross stretches from what he can see all the way beyond his feet, that direction of, of the horizon. And if he tilts his head all the way back, the head of the cross, the top of the cross, reaches all the way to that horizon. And the arms of the cross reach all the way to either side. So you have the four cardinal points, north, south, east, west, all covered. So why are there gems at those four points? Hand, hand, blood, blood, feet, blood, head, blood, why? Crown of thorns. Crown of thorns isn't, you know, just like the little thorns on a raspberry bush. Okay. It's thought that the kind of thorns this crown would have been woven from were thorns like you can get on some honey locust trees. Okay, that'll, or black locust trees. That'll get two, three, four inches long. And you take a vine that has those things and you wind it and then you, you don't just set it on the person's head. You set it and then you push. So those thorns dig in. Causes a lot of bleeding. Okay? So those are the gems that stand fair at the earth corners. All the angels of the Lord look on fair through all eternity. And you've got a gloss down there. These lines are difficult and much debated. There's been quite a few articles written about what do those lines mean? Who are fair through all eternity? Is that referring to the angels of the Lord? Is that referring to the sight? That, you know, it's kind of like Christ eternally crucified? It, nobody knows 100% sure. Okay? That was no felon's gallows. Who used the cross as a method of execution? Did the Jews? No. Romans. Why did the Romans use it? It was the most fearsome kind of death there was. Okay. How does crucifixion kill you? Anybody know? It's not from blood loss, though that could be significant. And it's not from pain, though that can also be significant. Is it from pain, though, and not from suffocating? Yes. See, when you think of this as the cross, so you don't just, you know, nail the person on it and set it up. Because what's going to happen? You know, it's going to fall down. So you have to set it in the ground, like setting a fence post, right? 
if you're building a six foot tall fence, usually, depending on part of the country, if you live way up north where the cross line gets down pretty deep below beneath the surface of the of the ground, you have to dig a hole three feet deep. Down here in the south, you can get by with a foot and a half to two feet deep. So if you have an eight foot post, you sink it in the ground two feet to keep it from wobbling as much. Well, the crosses generally stood taller than six feet. Right? They'd be eight, ten, twelve feet. They'd be you know like six by six beams. So you gotta dig a hole three to four feet deep. You nail the person onto the cross when the cross is lying flat on the ground. Then you raise it up, several people to lift it up, and if it gets in that hole, think of the hole, think of it like this. The hole's like this, the cross is like this. As you raise this up, at some point, what happens? Boom! It falls into the ground. Okay? What happens when it falls? Because the, the person's feet aren't standing on something. They're just nailed. Well, when it falls into the ground, you're being supported by nail, nail, nails, you know, through. So your feet are together like this, probably, going through both legs. When it falls, tears, tears. And your shoulders just lift. And you go, oh, because when both shoulders dislocate, your lungs get compressed and you can't take deep breaths. See, the reason, if you go back to the Gospels for a moment, the reason the high priests go to Pilate and they say, um, it's the day of preparation. In other words, Passover starts, you know, at evening. Can you go take care of them so we can take their bodies down? Because it's against the Mosaic law to leave them. They should do whatever you need. So they get soldiers to go and do what? Break their legs or stab them. Kill them. Because if the crucifixion happened, let's say, on Monday, let them hang. Let them hang until they slowly die of suffocation. But it happened Friday afternoon. Had to be taken down from the cross within about six hours at the very most. So stab them, break their legs and such. So speaker goes on. Wondrous was the victory tree. Victory tree. In other words, this sign, this beacon, was a tree of victory. It's not, he said, a felon gallows. We tend to think gallows simply means noose, right? Somebody's being hung to death. No, gallows refers back to the throat. Right? The God. So, wondrous was the victory tree, and I was stained by sin. Why does the speaker introduce himself at that point? So this tree was wondrous. It was full of wonder, and it was wonder-inspiring. And I was stained by sins. What's the speaker doing? That tree is because of me. That's what he's doing. In other words, we're going to see all throughout the poem. The speaker wants to make sure he has his theology down pat. He's got it all correct. The speaker doesn't want to be con con not confused, convicted of heresy or blasphemy. All right? And we'll see that when we get into a little bit more. It was wondrous. I was stained by sins, wounded with Guilt. Okay. Wounded. Guilt, you know, stuck in me. I saw the tree of glory. Okay. 
the victory tree, the wondrous tree, the beacon. I saw the tree of glory honored in garments, shining with joy, bedecked with gold. Jim said covered worthily the creator's tree. Ah, now the speaker says, it's the creator's tree. How is it the creator's tree? God's tree, because he made it. How else is it the creator's tree? Because the speaker is going to tell us later on. Because the creator hung on the tree. Okay? But here he's talking about, you know, this thing's covered in gold and jewels. Go to, I don't think my book has any pictures. And it really should. Nope, it doesn't. Um, go to a, you know, a high church, like an Anglican church, some Catholic churches, an Orthodox church, and look on the altar at you know, either the Bible or what's called the Gospel Book, the Book of the Four Gospels, okay? Nine times out of ten, as that book sits on the altar, it won't be just like, you know, if this was a copy of the New Testament or something. This part and this part will have a book cover. It'll be in a book cover. And that cover will often be made of gold or shiny brass to look like it, and have gems in it, or fake glass that looks like gems. In this period, would be made of gold, and these would be real gemstones. This is one of the reasons why the churches were hit first by the Viking raiders. Because you could take that gold, and you could melt it down. You could take those gems, and you could sell or barter them, okay? <coughs> So it's bedecked with gold, and gems are covered worthily in the creator's tree. And yet beneath that gold, I began to see an ancient, wretched struggle. When it first began to bleed on the right side. Why is the tree bleeding on the right side? Because that's the side of Christ that the soldier thrust his spear in. Okay, so notice what the poet slash speaker is doing. Christ bled on the right side, the tree bleeds on the right side. He's identifying the cross with Christ. Right? In the ancient wretched struggle, that's another passage that a lot's been written about. What's the ancient wretched struggle? Is it Christ on the cross? Is it humanity versus Satan? Fall of Adam? I was all beset with sorrows, fearful for that fair vision. Okay, you see a cross and it starts bleeding on the right side. How do you call that a fair vision? <clears throat> Fair meaning beautiful. Wouldn't it be kind of scary? <laughs> I saw that eager beacon change garments and colors. Now it was drenched, stained with blood, now bedecked with treasure. So, question to ask. Is it literally in the vision? That one moment be decked with garments and jewels and gold, the garment being like gold plating and jewels, and the next moment, it's just raw wood dripping with blood. And it kind of goes back and forth, you know, like you get one of those holographic cards and you change, move it and it changes the image, is it that kind of thing? Or, is it one and the same image? Is the blood in gore really the gold and jewels? Is the blood, the quote unquote, you know, according to a lot of Christian hymns, the precious blood of Jesus, is that 
begins. Right? <clears throat> now it was drenched, stained with blood, now it be decked with treasure. And yet, lying there a long while, I beheld in sorrow the Savior's tree, until I heard it utter a sound. So he says, I lay there for a long time, and I just saw this thing, and it kind of, you know, went back and forth, seemingly, until it spoke to me. That best of woods began to speak words. This is an example of <clears throat> anybody know the poetic term for an inanimate object that speaks? No, kind of close. Crossopopia, right? Um, we obviously didn't read it. There's a couple of old English, a couple of other old English poems that involve prosopopoeia. One is um, the husband's message, which is thought to be a companion piece to the wife's lament, which is in your book. The husband's message involves a piece of wood that has something carved on it, but the wood speaks. Right? Um, you see this used throughout literature. J.R.R. Tolkien in his Middle Earth stuff, he's got swords that speak. Well, a sword obviously is not a living creature. Dragons speak, but they're living, breathing, you know, sentient beings. Even when we get to, you know, um, Beowulf, Grendel thinks, the dragon thinks because there's sentience there, but Beowulf's sword never says anything, right? So here we have the cross. A dead piece of wood. It was so long ago. I remember it still. That I was felled from the forest edge, ripped up from my roots. Strong enemies seized me there, made me their spectacle, made me bear their criminals. They bore me on their shoulders, they set me on a hill. Enemies enough fixed me fast. They made me their spectacle. And I have a feeling that Lisa, I don't remember what the old English word is, there for spectacle. Where is that? 32. Um, I can't remember what that old English exactly means. But I kind of think he uses the word spectacle because of its relevance to Greek literature, Greek tragedy in particular. Aristotle, in his Poetics, talks about you know Greek tragedy and the the deaths that usually happen. Right? Um, if you've taken Dr. Neff's, I think he goes English. I'm sure he does. Uh, when he teaches English, thirty four hundred. Right? which is European lit to 1400. When I teach it, we talk about it um, also. According to Aristotle, when, whenever you have a death that occurs within the play, that death occurs off stage. It wasn't appropriate for it to be seen. Right? So, I mean, you get a lot of deaths, right, in Greek tragedy. I mean, think Oedipus. Oedipus's wife, she hangs herself at the end. Right? That happens behind the doors of the palace. All right? Uh, Oedipus blinds himself behind the doors of the palace. It's not something that polite society should see. So he says, they made me their spectacle. And the term that was used for the Greek was, if something is a spectacle, it happens off stage. The speaker is saying, but they made me front and center. It didn't happen off stage. It happened where everybody could see it. Made me bear their criminals. 
They bore me on their shoulders, set me on a hill, enemies enough fit to me fast. Who are the enemies he's talking about? The Romans. The Romans are the ones who cut down the tree and such. Then I saw, and he begins this passage where we're going, where we are going to alternate. between man and God, or terms referring to man and God. Then I saw the Lord of mankind, God, okay, hasten eagerly when he wanted to ascend upon me. But this is also this. He's the Lord of mankind. Notice it doesn't say the Lord of heaven. The king of glory, the host, you know, the leader of the host of hosts and such. Okay? And notice, he hastened. He did what? It's like he saw them fixing the cross beam on the vertical pole, and he ran. He couldn't wait to ascend upon me. I did not dare to break or bow down against the Lord's word. What's the speaker mean by word? Command. I didn't dare break the Lord's command. Okay? Remember when we talked? Maybe I'm talking about the Bible. <clears throat> you know, Lord, thing. What must the thing do? That's you need to talk about this more in the debate. Yeah, I should probably get into that. <clears throat> this comes from Gail Wren, a study, it's a very old book now, a study of old English. He talks about the fourth wall dramatic epic. What's meant by epic? You know, you hear the word ethics bandied about all the time. The human relationship, how we interact with each other. Okay? There are four parts to this one, two, three, four. First part duty to your Lord. Second part duty to your kin. Third part duty to avenge one's lord or kin. And the fourth part, a reliance, you can just call it, on weird. Kind of like faith and fate. That what will be will be. And you can kind of put, you know, in parentheses after that, though it's never stated, and it'll all work out fine. <laughs> kind of. Right? So this is the fourfold dramatic epic. Duty to your Lord. If you have an earthly Lord, you must do what that Lord says. Now, bear in mind, think about the Lord thing relationship. What's the flip side of that? If your duty is to go fight and battle for your Lord, what is the Lord's duty in response to that? Pardon? No, because you're actually protecting the Lord to reward you. In other words, all the stuff you win in battle, it's the Lord's responsibility to become the gold giver, the gold friend, to pay you in gold with that treasure. Okay, so that's the first part. These are in order. Okay? So duty to your Lord, that's the number one. Duty to kin, to your family. Now, that could be your immediate so to speak, nuclear family, it could be your tribal family. Right? It could be, you could expand that to your national family. Just reading something this morning, you know, the uh, leader of the WHO, the World Health Organization, is, you know, got his kickers on a lot because he's upset that first world countries, United States, Europe countries, they're talking about booster shots for COVID. 
when there's an awful lot of part, awful lot of the world that hasn't had a first shot. You know, take care of those who haven't had it yet, then get your booster shot. And others in the first world countries, they're thinking what? They're thinking this. We got a responsibility to ours first, then you know the others. Okay. So just to show this isn't just some egghead theory by some Anglo-Saxon scholar. Third, duty to avenge your lord and kin or kin. So if somebody kills your lord, and there's a great scene that typifies this in the old Untouchables movie with Kevin Costner and Sean Connery. Kevin Costner, the brand spanking new G-Man FBI agent who's out to take out, you know, Al Capone and Sean Connery, the wise and old, I think he's a Chicago cop, you know, and says, if they takes out one of yours, you takes out five of theirs. It's not an eye for an eye. It's a couple of bodies for an eye. Okay? So, somebody hurts your Lord, kills your Lord, you are duty-bound to avenge that death. Similarly, somebody takes out a member of your family, harms a member of your family. You know, if you're a father and somebody, uh, you know, some guy rapes your daughter, it's your duty to kill them, SOB, et cetera. Right? The problem with all of this is when this one becomes self conflicted or when these come into conflict, conflict. What if your Lord kills your brother? You're screwed. That is the catch-22. Because you have a duty to obey your Lord, but you also have a duty to avenge your dead brother. How do you do that? Well, the only way you can avenge your dead brother is by killing the person who killed him. But you can't kill your Lord. <laughs> The system doesn't work in other words, right? So, I did not dare to break or bow down against the Lord's word. That is, I had a duty to obey the Lord. Even though this is a tree speaking, not part of humanity. But it's whose tree? The Creator's tree. And the Creator's word is the one that he dare not break. When I saw the ends of the earth tremble, he's referring to the earthquake when Christ was crucified. Easily I might have felled all those enemies, yet fast I stood. I haven't seen any article, and I've read quite a few articles on this poem. I haven't seen any article that really addresses that line. What does the speaker mean? What does the cross mean? Easily, I might have felled all those enemies. How? Is this some weird, you know, uh, Yoda, Count Dooku, Jiu-Jitsu thing where the cross is going to jump out of the ground and start? How could the cross have done this? Or is it just boasting? Right? Then the young, young hero, and pretty clearly on the man's side, <laughs> then the young hero made ready. That was God Almighty. Right? Young hero, notice the kind of language, Germanic, the hero, this isn't the later Middle Ages suffering servant. You know, the kind of wishy-washy, rather effeminate-looking Jesus with the tears streaming down his face. Oh, I don't really want to do... No, this is... Come on. Bring it. <laughs> he did what? That was God Almighty, strong and resolute. What does resolute mean? If someone says, they, you know, 
You are resolute in your decisions. What does that mean? Firm, not going to change. Right? He ascended on the high gallows. That, that means he climbed up. He didn't have to be dragged, kicking and screaming. Brave in the sight of many, when he wanted to ransom mankind. Ransom. What's a ransom? What action is ransom usually involved in? Kidnapping, right? I kidnap somebody, I take that person there in my possession. Somebody else must pay a ransom to get that person freed. Okay, so who's the ransom being paid to? According to some, more modern theology than the theology that would have been prevalent in this time period, it's God. <laughs> but according to this time period, the ransom to Satan. Okay. Or more, let's put it that way. When he wanted to ransom mankind, what is ransom? Buy off, redeem mankind. I trembled when he embraced me. And there's been, I shouldn't even mention this, but I will there's just been some absolutely bet, you know what, crazy criticism about, you know, Christ's homoerotic desire for the cross and he's climbing up and having sex with the cross. It's utter nonsense, right? When he, em what's that imply? Embraced me. Embracing what? Well, what's the cross an instrument of? Death. Yeah. Death. What's he doing? Metaphorically. Taking death into his arms. Okay. It's going to be kind of interesting because we're going to see in Beowulf. In the Old and Before Beowulf, whenever Beowulf kills a human person, and I say whenever he kills a human person because we only have an actual account of once that he does that. He does it by giving the person a bear hug. <laughs> he squeezes this person to death. All right? So, when he embraced me, but I dared not bow to the ground. That is, the cross is telling us, I wanted to. I wanted to fall down to the ground, but I couldn't. Or fall to the earth's corners. I had to stand fast. We're obviously not going to get near as far as that house. I was reared as a cross. Reared there, both meanings. Reared, like raised, my purpose was, for the tree I was, to become a cross. But it also means I was raised up, boom, as a cross. I raised up the mighty king, the lord of heaven. There, there we go. The mighty king. King, Lord of heaven, right? I dare not lie down. They drove dark nails through me. Now, we could quibble on that if we wanted to. We could go all lawyer-like and say, um, no, actually, the dark nails went through, because through is not the same as in, correct? Through means starts here, comes out here. I once, as a kid, I was doing something in our backyard around some wood, and I had on like tennis shoes, and I stepped on a piece of wood that had the nail sticking. And it went through my foot. And I quickly stepped back off, you know. Didn't need stitches or anything. He says, the nails went through me. The scars are still visible. The open wounds of hate. I dare not harm any of them. The cross is telling us, when they hit me with those nails, oh, I could have, I could have harmed them, but I didn't. They mocked us both together. Really? Go back and read the Gospels' accounts of the crucifixion. Never once will you find, oh, you mighty powerful tree, you know, grow some roots and walk away. They don't do that. 
What do they say? If you're the son of David, get off. If you're the son of God, prove it. I was all drenched with blood. Notice the tree doesn't say, I bled all over. Flowing from that man's side after he had sent forth his spirit. Okay, we will stop there. So it might take us three days.